Hey everyone, welcome to Hope City Church. My name's Ken, this is my friend Caitlin, and thanks so much for engaging in online church today. Uh, if you're newer to Hope City, uh, I would love to direct you to hopecity.ca forward slash new. It's a great first way to kind of reach out, say hello, and get any questions that you have about our church answered. Yeah, you definitely want to make sure that you bookmark that page so that you can reach it at any point. If you have kids, another site that you want to bookmark is hopecity.ca forward slash kids. Our team here is incredible. Our kids team is always praying for you guys, is passionate to see your kids grow. And so they're producing online content that you can access at any time. So whether you tap into that today yeah. or you tap into that any day this week, it's there for you. I know we use it virtually every week. We kind of get our kids set up on an iPad and we engage in online church and it's, it's awesome. Yeah. We're so, so proud good. of our teams there. In just a moment, Pastor Bernie and Renee are gonna lead us in a time of worship. I was actually having a conversation with someone from my gym um, earlier this week, and they don't regularly engage with church, but they took in Church Online at one of our services, and they asked me, why do you sing? Like this, why do you sing in church? And I thought that was a really good question, because if you're newer to church, or you're newer to faith, I mean, that might seem really strange. To yeah, it's just... gonna be like, like a karaoke, basically. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, outside of like a birthday party, you're not really expected to sing, sing. Yeah. kind of in groups. And I thought, you know what, that is such a, a that's such a great question to, to ask. And the reason why we sing, there's actually a few reasons, but, but one of the reasons is we just always sang. Like, like whole books of the Bible are straight up just songs. songs. Yeah, but um, singing uh, engages our brain. And so think about maybe a song that you haven't heard for 10 years. It can come on the radio, you can listen to it, and you can remember every lyric. There's something about um, singing that helps us uh, remember things. And so when we sing you know, worship songs, when we sing to Christ, uh, we are imprinting on our brains truth about God. And so we're learning about God as we sing. Another thing that singing does is it unites us. You know, last time that you were at an Oilers game, okay, I've never been, but what? I know I've never been to an Oilers game. Okay. One day, <laughs> but not this year, but yeah. one day. <laughs> last time you were at an Oilers game and you're singing a national anthem, it like unites you, right? Yeah. You're singing this and it kind of brings everyone together around something. You know, when we sing in church, it unites our hearts and our minds around Christ. And so whether you're in your living room and you're with a few people today, or whether you're, a, you know, have a watch party going on on Facebook and you're with, with some friends, or whether you're alone, you need to know that there are a whole lot of other people at this moment that are going to be singing with you, uniting us around Christ. So as we engage in worship right now, let that encourage you. Christ is 
Jesus, we thank you for your goodness. And we thank you for these lyrics that we're just saying because um, this is something we can build our life on. They're, they're just true. This is, this is real. Lord, you are good and you are faithful and we have seen that throughout our lives. And we don't always recognize it. We don't always pay attention or notice it. But Lord, right now, uh, Lord, we just declare it, that it is true and we thank you and we worship you because of it. Lord, for those who, for, who hear that, who, who hear that you are good and you are faithful and you are present in their life, but they don't, they don't really sense that that's true. Maybe they haven't experienced that and they're not sure what to think. Lord, even right now, in this very moment, would you fill their room, would you fill their heart and their mind with your presence and would they experience your goodness? I pray this in your name. Amen. If you're walking through something or you want prayer for something specific, our team would love to pray for you. Like we would love that honor. And so why don't you head to hopecity.ca forward slash prayer and be prompted from there. Okay, so I cannot believe that we're already in August. I know. <laughs> like, I'm just like, what is happening? Where is my yeah, summer? It stresses me out just a little bit. But thankfully this summer has been like, this week at least this has been really nice. Great. Yeah, can you notice my tent? Oh yeah, so can, okay. <laughs> but what we're so excited for is that on August 29th, we are doing a back to school drive-through for yeah. kids as they head back to school. Yeah, and so, you know, this season has negatively affected a lot of families financially. And now that we got news that we're heading back to school, we know that's gonna be really challenging for a lot of families to be able to get a backpack and get supplies. And so we're gonna sponsor 300 kids from our community to go back to school. Yeah, we're giving them like a backpack, yeah. new supplies. Yeah. It's gonna be amazing, we're so excited. Yeah. And what's so amazing is that we announced it for the first time last week yeah. and like every volunteer yes. position is filled. Yeah, so thank you so much for engaging that way. That's great. Yeah. There is still another way that you can help. Uh, it costs $35 to send a kid back to school because we're able to buy so much in bulk. It's a pretty good deal. Yeah. Um, and so we could use your help. Just head to hopecity.ca forward slash drive through and you can give there. Yeah. yeah, and it's because of uh, your continual generosity and giving that we're able to do things like this. Uh, and when you give, you're able to be part of something so much bigger than, than just anything you can do on your own and it's so, awesome to be part of a church that can do things like this. It's the best church. Yeah, really. I love it. Come yeah. on. And so if you'd like to give, you can head to hopecity.ca forward slash give. And there's a variety of different ways, convenient ways for you to give. And so thank you so much for your generosity. So we've been walking through an incredible series called Weeds, where we are navigating the weeds that can come up in our life. And this week, we have the honor and privilege of hearing from our amazing youth pastor, Pastor Ruben, as he embarks on the topic of apathy. So for me personally, I accepted Jesus at a later time in my life. I chose to follow Jesus uh, just before 18. It was this surreal memory, a moment that's still embedded in my memory. Um, long story short, I was this kid who was very disinterested with God and, and Christianity. But on this one weekend, I was forced to go to this youth conference in Ontario. And I remember on the very first night, the speaker was talking about the Father's love. And as he was coming towards a close, uh, I kid you not, as he was finishing up, my heart started to beat um, uncontrollably so fast that I even had to shrug my leader's shoulder and warn him, hey, like I might need you to call the ambulance. And it was at that moment that the speaker all of a sudden said, said, listen, if your heart is beating so fast, if you can't control it, this may be your moment to accept Jesus. I'm like, come on, like, give me a break. And I tried to fight it. I was in the back bleachers with black hoodie and it was all a blur because within a blinking moment, I went from the back of the bleachers of the stadium to the front concrete floor on my knees, just bawling my eyes out and crying and giving my life to Jesus. It was an emotional moment for me. And let me tell you, it wasn't like the cute cry. Like, do you know like that cute cry where it's, you, aw, that's cute, adorable. Like, no, it was like the ugly cry, like the snot all over your clothes and on the floor. But it was like this amazing moment for me. It was the best uh, time of my life because my life was changed. And I was starting to live and like it. And even six months later, um, God prompted me to become a pastor. And I was planning to go to Bible college and I was excited, but also nervous. Because in my naive mind, I thought that these Bible college students were like super Christians because it was 
only months into my journey with God, and I felt like this little immature child compared to these Bible college students. And so uh, when I was picturing Bible college, I was picturing people with like these white gowns, like angelic, and they weren't like, walking in my mind. They were just kind of levitating. And that's honestly what I thought what I was going to get myself into. And I was so scared uh, in case I forgot to pray for my food, just in case they're going to lash out at me and stuff like that. And even for the first time, I walked into the dorms with my parents. I took my first step into the lobby and I looked to my left and I saw this guy just playing the guitar and I looked to my right and there's just three people singing um, In Christ Alone, this old Christian hymn. And I looked at my mom like, I am not going to fit in here. All I knew growing up was Bon Jovi and Kiss and the closest thing I knew to Christian music was anything written by Bono from U2 or even Kanye West. Um, But the first semester came and went and it was fantastic. It was a dream. I was being obedient to what God has called me to do. And it was this adventure. I was digging to my Bible. I was learning from my professors. Second semester now came and went. And I'm now getting involved with my church. I'm volunteering at youth group. Third semester came and went, and now I'm diving into internships. And I just got elected to be on student council. But then fourth semester came. Halfway through my second year, and all of a sudden, I just hit this wall. What was once this this passionate pursuit of God's call has now turned into this mundane routine at a Christian college. What was once getting life um, out of the Bible turned into now assignments from now what is called a textbook. You know, we had prayer meetings. We had chapels three times a week. We had student council, church, volunteering with youth, internship. It was so much. So looking back, hindsight What was once this passion now turned to apathy. It wasn't like this love for God anymore. It was just now just ticking boxes. Like I've completed my chores when I was a child. See, life became mundane, repetitious, and and I was now going through the motions. See, when I accepted Jesus into my heart, I was so once spiritually enthusiastic, but at that moment I felt spiritually numb. Was this normal? Is this what a Christian goes through? Should a Christian go through this? Like I was excited to read my Bible, but now it just turned into a book where I do my assignments from. I used to love going to chapels three times a week, but now it's just, it's just too much church. See, professors started taking notice of it and called me out on it. And I actually got a little bit scared and I felt like I was in a dangerous spot because now I thought in my mind, I was not going to be used by God and for his plan. And so when I chatted with my professor, um, it was the first time I heard this word apathy. And see, in the summer, we're in the series called Weeds. And, and today, uh, the weed of apathy, see, it begins with a root. And its root today is a lack of passion from what Christ originally did in our hearts. See, there's this incredible passage in the Bible that is both encouraging and challenging to this topic. And it's found in actually the last book of the Bible in Revelation chapter two, verses one to five. And let's take a look at it. It says, write this letter to the angel of the church in Ephesus. This is a message um, from the one who holds the seven stars in his right hand, the one who walks among the seven gold lampstands. So just to give you a heads up, in the passage here, there are seven letters written to seven churches and uh, every letter kind of has a different theme, but overall the umbrella of truth is still the same. Just like, get back to Jesus, get back to Jesus. So he continues, I know all the things you do. I have seen your hard work and your patient endurance. I know that you don't tolerate evil people. You've examined the claims uh, of those who say they are apostles, but are not. You discovered they're liars. You're patiently suffered for me without quitting. Good stuff, huh? But I have this one complaint against you. You don't love me or each other as you did at first. Look how far you've fallen. Please turn back to me and do what you did at first. If you don't repent, meaning if you don't turn around, then I will come and remove your lampstand from its place among the churches. A bit blunt, huh? Like why this type of language towards this church? We have to understand Ephesus, that the city is so important. It was an important city economically. It was an important city politically. And it was an important city religiously. So why is this important? It's because this city and this church has a lot of influence towards its adjacent communities. See, Jesus is writing to them so honestly and bluntly, trying to illustrate to them the severity of the issue that's at hand. That lack of passion and growth of apathy will start to now reciprocate itself onto other things that they're doing in the church. 
it could turn to a very slippery slope and then end up being this unfortunate cycle. So it's agreed that the theme of this letter to the church of Ephesus is a lack of passion, aka a disinterest in the things of God, aka apathy. But you know, it's not all that bad. You see, they're doing a great job in a lot of areas here. So as we go forward, like he's commending them for a bunch of things. He's commending them for hard work. He's commending them for their patient endurance. He's commending them for their standard to not tolerate evil people. And then later on in verse three, he really commends them for just patiently suffering without quitting. But there's this one thing just one thing that he's nailing them on. And it's the one thing that's the overall driver of the entire Christian journey. It's the love behind it. It's the fervor, the passion. See, they had it technically all together. You know, this church, they were serving, they were working, they were giving, renovating the building. They were even amening the preacher. But their doctrine and their truth became stronger than their passion for the person of Jesus. It was all in their head, but they lost it in their hearts. And that's what Jesus cares about. What good is it to know about God when you don't really know God personally? See, God is the only one that will instill that passion, but that can't happen if you don't allow him to work in your life. So perhaps for this church in Ephesians, in this passage, passage, had begun to take for what granted what they had in Christ in the first place. So going back to verse four, and I want to read this in the message translation because it says it quite nicely. It says, but you walked away from your first love. You walked away. Why? What's going on with you anyway? So like, what's the backstory? Like what happened that allowed you to forget about your first love? And I really had to go through this and examine my own life. So what caused me to lose my love and passion for God? What causes apathy? There's a couple of things here. Um, Number one, it could be um, self-sufficiency. See, thinking that you have it all together material-wise and also spiritually-wise. See, in this next chapter, Jesus writes to another church, another letter, but still the umbrella of truth is all the same. But he goes on in uh, Revelation chapter three, and he writes this. You say, I am rich. I've acquired wealth and do not need a thing, but you do not realize that you are wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. See, having things can lead to apathy. Having so many little things can leave us at times numb to the things that actually matter. So the more and more you have, it can sometimes cause us to be less enthusiastic to the things that matter. And yeah, we want to push towards the bigger picture, but sometimes we just don't tend to care now because it may not satisfy our taste buds. See, God is a God of new things. He continually wants to grow and challenge and encourage and give gifts to his children. But when we live lives of self-sufficiency, it's like we're walking around with our hands and our arms full. And it could look okay for a moment, but then when God wants to give you a new thing or a new promise, you can't get anything because your hands are already full and already handcuffed. See, when you live a self-sufficient life, you could be in danger of living an apathetic life. And when you live an apathetic life, then you, then you treat God like he's just one trick pony and then your spiritual maturity will never grow because you're just content to live life like this. Hands full, don't need anything else, spiritually numb now to the things that break the heart of Jesus. So the second thing could be this, self-sufficiency, then distractions. See, usually in the Bible, the devil will often not to come and just wipe you out. That's not his tactic. His tactic isn't just to destroy you, but to sometimes distract you. Now, I'm gonna, uh, this is in Mark 4, 19, kind of the base um, verse of our series called Weeds. And just to give you a little recap, this is a parable of the farmer throwing seeds in the ground. And then some of them are growing and giving life, but for others, it's a different story. But here, check it out. But the worries of this life, the deceitfulness of wealth, and the desires for other things come in and choke the word, making it unfruitful. Take a look at this. But the worries of this life the deceitfulness of wealth and the desires of other things. The Bible did not come to write uh, COVID or World War III or killer hornets. Like these things are not means of destruction. 
it's a distraction. And so if he can distract you, then he will leverage it to make, make you de- deviate away from your purpose in life and get you to live outside of God's calling. And now all of a sudden, things that bring life are now numb. And then all of a sudden, you're not bowing down to God's throne anymore, but now you're bowing down to your own throne that you made for yourself. And now, unfortunately, you won't be able to see God because you're in the way. You see these examples right here. These are not direct, uh, direct attacks on you. These are just opportunities. And the ball is in your court to see how you will respond to these. See, unfortunately, a lot of people try to blame their mistakes on other things. Like, oh, it's my toxic workplace that's keeping me from God, or it's a lack of finances that make me not trust God. Well, like what if it is you? What if, it, what if you're in the way of what God has actually planned for you? You might be surprised. And, and, and even for myself, I have found that I've taken things into my own hands far too many times. And all of a sudden, out of nowhere, my heart grows cold. My routine is thrown off. I get short with people. And now my spiritual growth is now being choked out through this weed. So why is it important to name all this stuff out? Well, Because if we're not careful, our entire lifestyle um, starts to change. And so just a little test here. How do we, how do we know we're living in an apathetic lifestyle? Well, there's a few things here that's pretty straightforward. Okay. We have number one, we're more concerned with impressing people than living for God. Maybe you want to show off your car or your home or your, or, or different toys rather than showing off the things that God is doing in your life. See, I'm a victim of this myself. And at many times uh, I'm embarrassed or concerned of what people may think of me rather than what God has actually called me to do. So, if you keep working like this, you give your pieces away, then you can't give your whole life to God anymore. Number two, we are more obsessed with life on earth rather than life in eternity. See, don't get me wrong. Um, having things on earth is great. You know, um, the goal to have a great home or to, to buy things for your kids or to spoil your grandchildren, like these are all great things, but it can become an issue when the things of this world trump the things of God. Number three, we start justifying our own sin. See, and this is something that I really had to deal with as well. Like when we start to have a mentality of thinking like, oh, well, like um, at least I'm not as bad as others or, well, I'm not really hurting anyone or, well, everyone is gossiping. Then sooner or later, you will start to find that your heart as in mine can become very callous and numb to the things of God. Lastly, we only turn to God when we need him. When we need him. It's interesting when bad things happen that we would start to run towards God and start pointing the finger. But then when we're living in blessings, we're very reluctant to even acknowledge him. Now, please remember something. Apathy is one of the hardest things to self-diagnose, which can make it pretty dangerous if we're not careful, right? But just because we may sometimes live in an apathetic season doesn't mean that we're not good people. Like the Bible says in Revelation 2, the flame was burning with passion, but has just gone dim. So just because the fire has gone dim does not mean it can't be reignited again. So how do we get it back? How do we get the flame burning passionately once again? You know, the answer, it's actually surprisingly quite simple. And it's this, that we need to put ourselves in positions constantly, that will feel the weight of faith. Now I put this word faith right here on purpose because weight means that there's a resistance. There's, there's, there's friction. There's something that's being worked inside of you. So listen, we need to continually do what we've always been doing. We need to continually be soaking ourselves in the Bible because it's the direction of our lives. We need to soak ourselves in prayer because it really aligns our soul with God. We need to soak ourselves in worship, however that may look like for you, because it puts our souls at rest and puts us in awe of who God is. We need to give because it puts our souls in a position to trust God's power and his plan. So what did this uh, passage in the book of Revelation say? It said, if you remember, you fell away from your first love. You walked away from your first love. So now that poses the question, what did your first love look like? And how did it manifest itself? Well, for me personally, um, when I fell in love with Jesus, I fell in love with the things of Jesus. 
I shared my faith with people and tangibly got to see people saved. I was brought on this roller coaster of an adventure, not knowing what would be next, but just trusting him. I remember when I first accepted Jesus, I lived a life where I prayed every morning, Lord, if you do not come through for me today, I don't know what I'm going to do. So back to my original story in college when I hit a wall, I was so discontent with my soul state. I was growing cold and bitter. I was neglecting my devotions and it started affecting every other aspect of my life now. I needed to do something and I'll shake it up a little bit. So what did I have to do? So for me, in my college, I started this thing called SPC Loves Abbey. My school was called Summit Pacific College, which is the first letters of the acronym, and the school was in Abbotsford. So I started um, by bringing in a group of friends, and we would all pitch in money together to buy this massive container of coffee from Starbucks, and we would just stand in front of the grocery store and hand out free coffee to people, hoping to spark um, conversations about Jesus. Like, it really terrified me. Like, I was cringing before we did this, but I prayed, Lord, I need you to come through. In my heart, I needed to do this because I needed to feel the weight of stepping out in faith. Let me tell you, it was absolutely incredible. Some people got to meet Jesus, some inquired. Sure, a lot of people walked by, but by the end of the day, I saw God's power come through and it ignited this flame again inside of me. This other example, other stories, other time in college, um, I felt God tug on my heart that I had to give things away that I owned. So pretty much anything that was under $200, if, if, if someone would comment on it, I would offer to them as a gift. And it, it was actually quite awesome. Some people would come up to me and say, hey, cool hoodie. And I'd be like, well, thanks. Do you want it? And you should have seen the faces of them when I did that. It was so awesome. And when I did it, sure, I gave away some material possessions, but I felt the weight of faith to trust God that he would provide for other things in the future. Listen, I'm not trying to toot my own horn or anything, but I just wanted to illustrate to you what positions I needed to put myself in to ignite some sort of flame and get excited about the things of God once again. See, maybe your story is similar to mine, or it could be quite different. But for you, what could it look like specifically? Well, maybe you need to stand up for a cause that's bigger than yourself and may require you to do things that your coworkers, friends, and families may not be doing. Maybe you need to apologize to someone or forgive someone when you know you shouldn't. Maybe you need to reach out to someone that God put on your heart. Maybe it's a coffee or even a text. Maybe you need to pray for someone out loud. Maybe You should surround yourself with people that will inspire you and push you forward in your spiritual growth and your love for Jesus. Could be joining a small group, having coffee or lunch meetings with men and women uh, to be raw with each other. This could be a shameless plug because I'm the youth pastor here, but maybe you need to look to the youth. I'm constantly put in places where I'm inspired and encouraged by what my kids are doing. And maybe you just need to come book a visit on a youth night. Because, man, these students are so passionate about Jesus. They engage with worship. They spread their faith to their friends. If you don't know what Youth Alpha is, it's basically this little um, video series that sparks a conversation about life and faith. And, And guess what? This year we had students lead Youth Alpha in their school, specifically 14 schools right here in the city. Unfortunately, this year had to be cut off a little short. But last year, remember the numbers, that we had 28 students accept Jesus for the very first time. The best part was that these students led the sinner's prayer with them. It blows my mind with how amazing they are. You want to see what passion looks like? And maybe sometimes we need to look to the younger generation. So maybe you also need to attempt something new that you, you could never even pull off without God's help. Let me tell you, this was the hardest prayer that I've ever done, but probably one of the most amazing and the prayer is this. It's very simple. God, if you don't come through today, I don't know what I'm going to do. Because it puts you in a position of trusting God rather than yourself. And when you see God come through, then all of a sudden this passion starts to enter in again. The flame gets reignited. So this is a guarantee that apathy is a season. Apathy is a valley. Apathy is temporary, meaning that there's always a beginning and an end. 
we can feel stuck and stay stuck, or we can move forward together. I have this other guarantee that God is eternal. God has not met his match. And God just wants to be cried out to do what God has already been doing. Fill your life up with purpose. So you feel like you're moving towards apathy. Um, maybe the things of Jesus are not as interesting to you as before. Or maybe the enthusiasm and love behind everything you're doing is just growing a little dim. I believe in my whole heart that Jesus is the power to remove that weed and its root and allow you to live life that's passionate once again. Hey, if you're feeling like you're moving towards apathy, um, maybe the things of Jesus are not as interesting to you as before, and maybe the enthusiasm and love behind everything you're doing is just growing a little dim. Hey, listen, I strongly believe that Jesus has the power to remove that weed and its root and allow you to live that passionate life once again. If you've never had a chance to accept Jesus, um, we strongly believe here at Hope City that following Jesus is the best decision anyone can make. And so if you want to take that next step right now, then I'd love to pray with you at this moment. Let's pray together. So Father, we acknowledge our lives that it is nothing without you. I pray, Lord, that you would come and fill us up with your love and your grace and your compassion. Lord, we repent and turn away from all the things that we were doing before and now turn towards you. May we love you with all our lives and we are so excited to the adventure you're gonna be bringing us on. Lord, we also pray for those in our church that's going through the series right now. Lord, specifically through apathy, if things are growing a little dim or if there's some disinterest coming into our lives, I pray you remove these hurdles and obstacles that uh, draw us close towards you. Father, I pray again that you would instill passion into their lives again. I pray you bring in love once again into their lives. And Lord, that they would live life to the fullest as you called us to. So Father, I just pray for all of us together. Lord, excited for the journey and adventure you can bring us on. Pray all this in your name. Amen. If you prayed that prayer of salvation with us, like we're so pumped. It's an absolute incredible decision and you're in for an adventure ride. I'd love to encourage you uh, next to check out hopecity.ca slash life. There, we just wanna give you some free re resources to better understand the decision you just made. You can download this booklet to give you next steps on Christianity. You'll also have a chance to sign up for a course called Alpha, which sparks a conversation about life, faith, and Jesus. And you'll also have an opportunity to contact one of our pastors if you choose to do so. Hey, know that as a staff of this church that we are constantly thinking of you and praying for you. Maybe the series um, that will be a blessing and a challenge to you to live the life that God has called you to live. Love you guys. Take care. I am so thankful for that word on apathy that Ruben gave. You know, I don't know about you, but for me, apathy just can creep in and I don't even know that it's there. Like it just, and then it just shows up and you're like, oh my goodness. And it's so important for us just to make sure it doesn't exist. Like it can have no place in our life. And so I'm just so thankful for that. Yeah, and we don't want this to end here. And so, you know, each week we uh, kind of prompt you to continue to engage with it. We just call it talking about it. And so we're gonna throw some uh, questions on the screen. And so you can screenshot that if you're on your mobile device or you can pause it, you know, if you're on YouTube or Facebook. Um, and just engage with that with the people that are around you right now or people who are close to you that are just a phone call away. Uh, a great place would also be to go to social media. Is that what yeah. you are gonna say? I was gonna say, ah, oh, we're so in sync. Okay. You can go to our social media, go to Instagram. Yeah. We're gonna be having conversations about this specific topic yeah. all throughout the day. Yeah. So we wanna see you there. All right, see you next week.